last session, we covered the fact that neural networks can have intriguing properties. For instance, they could have blind spots. One way to find them was to find the perturbation that you're looking for. Try for that perturbation to be as small as possible, and then try to minimize your loss, uh, which, is, which is gonna depend on your classifier, so that the perturb image is gonna get classified as another label that you choose. So this is targeted. This is a targeted attack, and then you have to solve an optimization problem for it. For the next one, uh, you don't need to solve an optimization problem, but actually, to be honest, there is an optimization problem behind the scene. You're just taking one step of your gradient descent to, for your neural network to classify this image as another image. And you don't care what your label is. You just want your neural network to make a mistake, any mistake. And that's on targeted attack. This is much faster because all you need to do is to take gradient of your loss with respect to the input, compute its sign, and then it's game over. And we know that computing the gradients of neural networks are really efficient. We can do backpropagation through them. Then we moved on to adversarial examples in the physical world. And this is a serious problem. Why is this serious? Because imagine there is a self-driving car on the road, or there are multiple of them in the future, you can print a stop sign, which you perturb a little bit. You take your printing and then you mount it on top of another stop sign. A human being is going to see that stop sign and he or she are going to stop, but the self-driving car is going to interpret the stop sign as a yield or as another or as the speed limit. And then they're going to go faster or slower. Or, so they're not going to stop. And that, that could lead to serious problems. So these are not adversarial examples, are not just for the digital world on your computers, but if you do some physical transformations on them, like printing them and then uh, taking a photo of them, they're gonna survive those sorts of transformations. And one other observation was the simplest is the method that you're coming up with the adversarial example, like fast gradient sign method, they are actually more effective. They're going to survive more in the face of these sorts of transformations. And that was the story of this table. We can move on to another way of coming up with adversarial examples. This time, you're going to keep changing pixels. So you can think of this in terms of L0 norm. The first paper that we covered was L2 norm. You didn't want your perturbations to be too obvious in the eye of L2 norm you wanted their L2 norm to be small. The second one and the third one that we cover are about L infinity norm. This one is about L0 and L0, you can interpret it as the number of pixels that you're changing in your image. And then you can see that you can change the class of zero to be classified as zero, as one, as two, as three, as four by modifying some of your pixel, some of your pixels. Similarly for six, seven, we can change them to be classified as any other class that you like. These are your targets, and then you can just make your neural network make a mistake by these small modifications. And this could be relevant to the idea of the sticker. You're changing a couple of pixels on the stop sign. So you have a deep neural network, you have some raw feature vector. So whenever in this slide I mention feature, think of it as pixel. So these are raw pixel values that you're changing and a bunch of raw uh, pixels are gonna give you an image. And then you have an output vector. This is coming out of your deep neural network. You want to come up with an adversarial example. You want to perturb your image a little bit by delta to obtain X star. Delta is the perturbation vector. And at the same time, you want the perturbation to be small so that a human cannot notice it. And at the same time, you want your adversarial example to be classified as something that you chose, a target. And the idea of this paper is adversarial saliency map. What is that? Let's go ahead and introduce it. Your neural network is gonna output a vector that has the same size as the number of classes. And these are the scores. These are your logits before pushing them through softmax to get you the probability distribution. 
So this is before softmax. You have a vector. The jth element is going to tell you how, what is the score of this image being classified as one or two or three or four. And then your label is that you are maximizing, you are choosing the maximum label, the maximum number. That's how your neural network is going to work in the end. You want to modify X, turn it into X star so that your neural network is going to misclassify your X as a target that you chose. So you have an image, you know the corresponding target, and then you want your neural network to make a mistake. Rather than giving you Y, it gives you T. What is the idea? You want to increase the probability or the score of the target that you chose because you want your neural network to make a mistake on that particular target. And then you want to decrease the score of every other class. That's your objective. But the question is, how are you going to achieve this? How are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to increase f of t while decreasing the other ones? By changing only a few pixels in your image. What is the big idea or what is the big picture? You want to find features and features in this paper are just pixels. You want to find pixels that the adversary should increase to achieve misclassification, to achieve this objective. So you are looking for pixels to change that will have the biggest impact for your objective. You can take a look at the gradient of every single output of your neural network. J could be one, two, three, four, five, up until 10 in this case. For every single score, you're gonna take the derivative with respect to every single pixel. And we know that to compute this, we can call this Jacobian. To compute your Jacobian, you're gonna need to do 10 rounds of backpropagation. Why 10? Because you have 10 output classes. And why only 10? Because as soon as you do one backpropagation, you're going to compute your derivatives with respect to every single pixel. So there is no need for you to have a for loop on XI. You're just computing it on the fly through one backward, one backward pass. And I is an input pixel. And this is going to guide us, try to find pixels to change that will increase the chances of misclassification. How? Let's take a look at J, I. This is one of your pixels. And then your target, T, is your target class. You want to increase X, I, because that's what you have here. You want to increase the value of that pixel a little bit. If J, I, T is negative, if you increase X, I, you are decreasing F, J, or F, T, actually. So you're decreasing F, T. And this is not what you want. You want it to increase F, T. So in this case, you do nothing. You don't change that pixel. You stay where you are. What are the other cases? Let's take a look at J for one pixel and any other class other than T. If they are positive, what's going to happen? If you increase XI, you're increasing FJ. And this is not what you want here. You want to decrease FJ. So in that other case, you're going to do nothing. You stay there. In any other case, you're, got, you're just going to uh, increase the pixel value by how much is sort of ad hoc. This is what this paper chooses. You know that if your J of IT is positive for one pixel and this summation is negative for that particular pixel for any other class, then you're going to increase the value of XI. The question is how much? This is how much you're going to change it. Okay. And this is coming sort of intuitive. So somebody gives us an image. They're going to give us a target. And then this way, you are going to know which pixels to change and how much you change them. This is actually an image itself. This is an image that is most of the time zero and sometimes positive. And that is called a saliency map. And how are we going to use that? We are going to use it this way. Somebody gives us an image. So this is going to correspond to this little x here. That's, the, that's your image. Y star is your T here, is your target. Somebody gives us a pair of image and a target, and this is the class that we want our neural network to confuse. You have your neural network F, which corresponds to this little f here. You're going to give it the maximum distortion. You don't want to distort more than a value, otherwise people are going to notice it. And then how much you're going to change each, each pixel. And theta is going to become clear. So theta are not the parameters of F. These are how much you want to change each each pixel. You start with your image. There is no change to be made. 
this is all of your the indices of all of the pixels in your image. So this set corresponds to i. And then you're going to write a while loop. What is that while loop doing? For as long as your perturbation is not too big, keep modifying pixels. At the same time, if you haven't achieved your objective, which is misclassifying X star as Y star, keep doing this, keep changing pixels. You need a derivative of your neural network with respect to X star, because that's your Jacobian. That's what's gonna help you compute the saliency map. Compute the saliency map. It depends on your neural network and the target that you chose and the image. And that's gonna give you a map. Now, what you are gonna do is you want to pick the pixel that, we, that if you change it, will have the most impact. So you're gonna choose the pixel i from this saliency map that if you change it, will have the most impact. And that's the pixel that you're gonna change. How much are you gonna change it? You're gonna modify the pixel value of your image by theta. And that's where theta is coming in. How much are you gonna modify it by theta? Then you're gonna compute your delta. If your delta is acceptable, keep doing this keep modifying pixels until you achieve your objective. So that's the algorithm. Any questions about it? Okay, perfect. Now let's look at success rate. You are gonna pick, this is a hyperparameter for this algorithm, the maximum distortion. You pick that hyperparameter and then you can actually count the number of times that you are successful in your entire data set or in your entire test data of converting a zero to a zero, a zero to a one, a zero to a two, et cetera. And that's your success rate. And these are out of 100%. So I'm just introducing the notion of success rate. You're just gonna count the number of times that you are successful in converting an eight to a six. What else? You picked your maximum distortion for this algorithm that was a hyperparameter, but in the end, you don't have to match that maximum distortion Sometimes your algorithm is going to stop early because you achieved your objective. F of X star is actually equal to Y star. And then you're going to stop. What is the average distortion necessary to convert a zero to a zero, a zero to a one, etc.? Okay, so far so good. So the question is, how do we determine theta and Y star? So these are, again, your hyperparameters. What are your hyperparameters here? It's theta. It's the maximum distortion value. And I guess that's it. And Y star, somebody is going to give us to us. In this case, Y star is going to be zero, one, two. So you're doing all of your cases. You're considering all of the cases. Now the question is, how do you actually set these hyperparameters? And that's why I'm going through this a little bit of math here or a little bit of uh, definitions. You can take a look at your success rate by changing the maximum distortion. You are changing your success rate. And then you can use your success rate to determine, are you happy with this uh, algorithm or are you not? Are you happy with this value or not? So that's how you're gonna set it. And there is another question. If we had more than one channel, would we have to calculate for each J, the Jacobian for each channel? Yes. So, and in fact, this is gonna do it on the fly. Uh, once you take the derivative of one of your outputs, with respect to whatever channel that you have or whatever pixel that you have, this is gonna happen. The back propagation is gonna give you that. So I here is not only counting your pixel location, it's also counting red, green, blue. Does that answer your question? And there is another question. What if we just want the network to classify wrong and don't care about what incorrect label it predicts? Then how does Y change? For that, we have other algorithms. This one is a targeted attack. For instance, the gradient sign method was an untargeted attack. And then at the same time, you can modify this algorithm again. Maybe all you want is to increase the probability or the score of any other class other than the one that the network is correctly classifying. So that one you can do a similar arguments. Does that answer your question? And by the way, targeted attack is harder than untargeted attack. So this task that you're solving here is harder. Okay, so now we know that the maximum distortion is gonna help us determine success rate and average distortion. And then you can define a hardness measure. So now this hardness measure is gonna help us combine the success rate and epsilon together. What is that telling us? 
you look at your distortion or your average distortion necessary to convert, for instance, a number two to be classified as a number seven. So that's S is number two, T is gonna denote number seven. And then we know that it's gonna depend on your tau and tau is your success rate. So tau we are gonna use to denote the success rate. Epsilon, we are gonna use it to denote the average distortion. And then this is gonna give us a hardness measure. How hard is it to convert a number zero to a number seven? This integral, you're gonna compute it using trapezoidal rule. You're gonna just sort your tau's. You're gonna sort your epsilons. And we know that as soon as you define your maximum distortion, you're gonna be able to compute the average distortion and your success rate. We just computed them. And then you can use the trapezoidal rule here to compute this integral. Now that's gonna give you the hardest measure. Let's plot it. How hard is it to convert a number zero to a number one? So it's really hard. How hard is it to convert a zero to a zero? How hard is it to convert a zero to a number five? And as you can see, eight is very easy to be converted to a zero. It's very easy to be converted to a two, to a three. Four is a little bit harder and eight to eight is the easiest. So this plot makes sense. But this hardness matrix is gonna depend on the choice of your distortion. There is another concept. This concept is really interesting because it's gonna help us actually define in a rigorous mathematical formulation what we mean by robustness. What do we mean that one neural network is more robust with respect to another neural network? You have an X, that's your image, you have a target that you chose, and then you can go ahead and count the number of pixels that you're gonna change according to your saliency map, because your saliency map was helping you decide which pixel to change. And as soon as it is positive, you are changing it. How many times is your saliency map positive in terms of your pixels and pixel counts? And you just count them and take an average. This number is always gonna end up being less than one, so you have an adversarial distance. How, what is the distance between an image, which is a number seven, to a target that you chose, maybe six? How many pixels do you need to change, relatively speaking? And that's gonna give you another matrix to plot. So it's very easy to convert a zero to zero. Their distance is basically very low, but then it's harder to change from zero to a one. So this is a proxy for this hardness matrix. They have similar pattern. Now this is the interesting part, robustness. How robust is your neural network? We can look at all of these distances for every single image in your data set and every single target, every single class in your data set. You are gonna look at the corresponding adversarial distance and then find a minimum. That's gonna give you a single metric to work with. And that's gonna give you a single metric to compare one neural network versus another neural network, because this depends on the neural network. This neural network is more robust with respect to the other neural network, and that's my metric, according to this metric. I think I'm gonna stop here and answer more questions, if there are any. So there is a question, why not sum all of these distances? Why just take a minimum for robustness? So you are just looking at the worst case scenario where you're taking the minimum. You could take the average, you could take the maximum is probably not a good one, but in the worst case scenario, how robust is your neural network? Okay, perfect. Any other questions? You might've already mentioned this, but in the calculation for robustness, would we perhaps want to leave out the diagonal in the adversarial distance matrix since we know it's super easy to um, modify a zero to a zero? Would, would we be interested in the off diagonal elements more? Yeah, so this is a little bit confusing and I agree. Any other questions?